Nurses of Reddit, what were the most haunting things someone said on their deathbed? My grandmother grasped the nurse's hand and said, I think I'm going to die now. The nurse was telling her no, she was doing much better and would likely leave soon, but my grandmother was gone before she could finish her sentence. She knew. Story two. I'm scared. Elderly gentleman. Worsening congestive heart failure, incapacitated, and his wife put him on hospice. He was comfort measures only. I was at the nurse's station and I could hear him starting to gasp for air. I walked into the room and he was struggling to breathe. I put my stethoscope up to his back but I already knew what was happening. His lungs were full of fluid. I sat him up in bed and he stared at me, eyes wide open, head tilted slightly back. Facial expression was full-blown panic. I'm scared. Immediately after he said the words, his oxygen mask started filling up with pink, red, frothy foam, running down his face and dripping onto his gown. He was dead within minutes, and all I could do was watch him. I will never forget his face. Story three. I didn't mean to. We were sending this middle-aged guy home after his ER visit. As soon as we moved him off the bed, he went unresponsive and had no heartbeat. We did a couple rounds of CPR, and he began to come too. He blinked a couple times, and the doctor running the code jokingly said, Sir, you almost died on us. The man said, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, in a sad way. His heart then stopped again, and we couldn't get him back. Since a lot of you are asking, it was most likely a saddle pulmonary embolism. He was there for something pretty mild, but he threw a clot right when he was being transferred. If you want to look it up, he had classic cape cyanosis across his chest, which is indicative of a big PE. Story 4. I started my nursing career on a palliative unit. In my first three months as a RN, I pronounced seven deaths. This one patient had advanced dementia and often believed he was at work while he was awake in the hospital. He would often give us, the nurses and care aides, tasks and jobs to do, as he believed himself to be our superior. One day near the end of December, he asks me, when is New Year's? What day is it this year? I tell him New Year's will be the upcoming Tuesday. He nods and tells me that he thinks he's going to have to quit after the new year. This job is getting too difficult for him and he can't keep up. It's time to retire. I tell him we appreciate all the hard work he's done and we'll miss him terribly when he's gone, that he was a great employee and we all loved working with him. That Tuesday, January 1st, he passed away peacefully in his sleep at 0200. I will never forget that conversation. Story 5. Many moons ago when I was a nursing student, a man in his 40s was lying on his deathbed from terminal cancer, his sobbing wife lying in bed next to him. He looked at his wife, using the last bit of energy he had to gently wipe away her tears and stroke her cheek. He took off his oxygen mask and said, Don't worry, love. Don't be afraid. It's just death and passed shortly after. Story 6. I'm a nursing student in Canada, and on my palliative rotation, I had a patient that was getting medically assisted dying the next day. He was an elderly cancer patient. He told me he was a self-ordained minister, nothing official, but an at-home type preacher, and that I could confess to him anything I wanted. I humored him and whispered to him some of my biggest secrets. I figured who cares he was going to die tomorrow anyway. He told me it was all right, and I could tell he appreciated that I confided in him. He also told me his email address and said that while he would not be sending emails in return, he would be receiving them. He was a cool guy. Story 7. I had to tell my grandmother that dialysis would only give her another week or so to live, and it was her choice to try or not. She was in and out of consciousness at that point and was in a clear state for the moment. She asked, will I die? I said, yes. She looked me in the eye and smiled just a little and said, sometimes you gotta do what you don't wanna do. She closed her eyes, squeezed my hand, and slept until she passed a day later. When things get hard, I always hear her say, sometimes you gotta do what you don't wanna do. Edit. I did not expect such a response. You've all warmed my heart and made me laugh a few times too. Thank you, and I'm really happy to see my grandma's resolve to go the way of all flesh with dignity has touched so many. Story 8. From when I worked in private practice. Had a patient get diagnosed with a moderately aggressive, but treatable, throat cancer. We tried everything we could think of to get him to consider treatment. He refused any type of treatment. So after about three months, his wife had their two adult sons basically carry him into the office at 4.50 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. I was the only nurse in the building. I got him into an exam room. Dude was completely gray, gaunt, and you could hear how close the end was every time he breathed. It wasn't exactly a death rattle, but you just knew his lungs were full of fluid. His sons sit him in a chair and he starts to slide out. The room was too small to put him on the floor and the exam table was too high to lift him up on it. I stood between his legs and held him upright in the chair while I told the sons to go get the doctor, told the wife to call 911. We all knew nothing was going to keep the man alive much longer. He patted the side of my leg. It was the most he could move and whispered, I should have listened to you all. I don't want to die. He lost consciousness and all I could do was just keep him from sliding out of the chair until the EMTs got there. After the ambulance got him to the hospital, he lasted about four hours. Story nine. 
I worked in a nursing home, and a lot of the people who were dying saw their spouses who had passed before them. One lovely old lady said her husband was in the room, and when I told her it was okay to go with him, she said, OMG, no, I hate him. I'm scared of him, and started to cry. All I could do was hold her hand and tell her I would send him away. She passed very shortly after that with a smile on her face. I hope he wasn't there for her. Story 10, short story, but we had a young patient years ago. She had a history of IV drug use had gotten sober a few months ago, but had developed endocarditis, infection of her heart, and had vegetation on her valves, as well as severe heart failure from dirty needles. She needed months of antibiotics, and then would be eligible to get a VAD, ventricular assist device, machine to bypass her heart and possibly bridge her to a transplant after being sober long enough. She had already been on the unit over a month. She was quiet, sweet, and reserved, but always thankful for her care. She had no social support. Her mother was who gave her drugs the first time, and she had no contact with anyone in her life except for one friend who came in once a week to check on her. On her 24th birthday, we got her a cupcake and sang her happy birthday. We hung a banner in her room, got her little presents, some games to play in the hospital, and adult coloring books. She said thank you, but didn't show a lot of emotion. She was always quiet, and we were not entirely sure how she felt at the time. That day, on her birthday, she went into cardiac arrest and died. We spent 45 minutes trying to get her back. Her friend came in to collect her things and showed us the message she sent her that day. It had a picture of the cupcake, presence and banner and said, I love my nurses. I don't know how to tell them, but they're the best family I've ever had. She did tell us in the end. I'll never forget her. I cried on and off the entire rest of my night shift. Edit. So I went to sleep between night shifts and woke up to read the comments and this blowing up. Thank you all. I'm glad it had some impact on others. This is not always an easy job. I love what I do and I appreciate the support. Sometimes nursing is emotionally devastating, but it can be incredibly enriching as well. This event was formative for me in many ways. I still think about the impact we all have on people around us. Even if they don't always have the ability to show it, please be kind. You never know when it might make you the best part of someone's life. Story 11. My great uncle's last words before he passed were, it is what it is. I know it's really common, but I find myself saying it quite a lot nowadays. It is what it is. My great aunt, who lived to be 101, was straight vegetative for like a month or so before passing the day after her 101st birthday. On the day of her birthday, she suddenly was conscious and awake as everybody had come to leave a birthday cake. She told stories and laughed. Then she went back to being comatose and died the next day. Woman loved her birthday, Lael Edit, went to work and came back to this having exploded Lael. I have been enjoying the conversation begun here, though. Story 12. Looked after a guy with end-stage heart failure. He kept having episodes where if he coughed or leaned forward, anything to increase his intrathoracic pressure he would pass out. He would come back after a few minutes and gradually go from purple back to pink. How long was I out for that time? He was fully mentally fine, sharp, witty, and at peace with what was going to eventually happen to him. Him and me were joking that one of these episodes were going to kill him as he sipped his tea and we talked rubbish. Five minutes later, it happened again, and he didn't come back. He had a DNR order, which was sensible. Very eerie to talk to somebody so vibrant and alert minutes before he died. Such a nice dude. I want to be in that mindset when I go too. Story 13. I'm a hospice chaplain. Many times people begin to talk to dead family members or pets and describe them there, or see heaven opening up or things like it. I've had a good many predict their death. One patient with ales requested to see me, and our conversation was about how she's ready and wanted me to help her prepare. Though she seemed months from death, she passed that weekend. One story, though, takes the cake. I was working in a hospital at the time. There was a spiritual, non-religious man I had a good connection with. He requested me to his room, so I came over. He motioned me to crouch by his bed and spoke in a whisper. Do you see my brother in the corner? I told him I don't, but I believe he is seeing him. He was completely lucid and calm as he explained he has been in the corner and he has been talking with him, hashing things out and coming to forgiveness like they weren't able to do before the brother died. He worried the nurses would think he's crazy and try to medicate him. When I assured him I believed him and just wanted to listen to what he had to say, he went on. I see death too. She was in the parking lot. I could see her from my window. She had my brother with her. Now she's in the room. She's all black, but she ain't ugly. He was totally at peace. Died a few days later when a tumor invaded an artery. Story 14. I've watched three people die. The first was my father. He died of non-smoker's lung cancer. He hallucinated a Labrador. Then a few minutes later, he tried to get out of bed and said, hang on, and he immediately went into cardiac arrest. Six months later, my son died before my eyes. 
unexpectedly at 20 months old. Not much to say about that, except that he looked confused before he died. Two years later, I watched my husband's grandmother die from cervical cancer. She kept asking what time it was. This is something I realized my father did when he passed too. She said she was ready to die, but didn't know what to do. We all just sat with her and laughed and told stories. I sat with her for like two days straight, and the second I left the room to care for my newborn, my husband called and said, she was dying. I think she wanted me to leave because she knew I had seen enough death before she went. She was an amazing woman. Edit. Feel the need to share that. On her deathbed, Grandma Kitty still found the energy to sing the ABCs with her brand new great-granddaughter. Literally, a gem of a woman. Story 15. Not a nurse, but my grandfather was put into a 24-7 care home with severe Parkinson's. My mom and grandma had spent four years basically taking care of him constantly and needed a break for a couple weeks, although visiting him every other day in shifts. I went one day alone, and he looked me straight in the eye and said, I need you to get me home so I can die. I can't do it here. I tried saying everything I could to the nurses and my family to get him home without saying what he told me. 24 hours later, he got rushed to emerge. As he was dying, he looked at me and said, don't let it bother you, and died. Still bothers me. Edit. I really just wanted to get this off my chest and sleep. I didn't anticipate the powerful dialogues with you all. Honestly, thank you so much. Story 16. I'm not a nurse, but my spouse's grandfather passed away last autumn. He was a biologist and loved the nature. Before he had passed away, he had explained he had seen in another dimension and how all life was connected and told his children that he wished they would meet again as molecules in a flower. I thought these things were beautiful and reflected well on his life, as someone who dedicated his time in learning about nature and its wonders. He had the most amazing life, and passing away so peacefully was a well-deserved end for a man as good as he was. Edit, holy crap to wake up and see my notifications blowing up. I'm so incredibly happy that the words of this man touched so many. He was an amazing person who traveled much, studied, read, and raised a family that spreads warmth and kindness where they go. Born between the two world wars, growing up with dyslexia during a time there was no term for it, and struggling through basic education, he fought his way to becoming a well-educated biologist. One story I've heard of him is about when he, his wife, and their three children were living in Africa and driving through a savanna. A male rhino charged the car and flipped it over. Luckily, they all survived. I consider it privileged to have met and known him. Story 17. This was during my final year as a medical student. I was working an internship. It was late, and we were doing our last rounds for the night right before the shift change. There was an elderly gentleman came from at home hospice, stage four cancer. COVID had limited family visits to short, short increments. Family often had to wait in the lobbies or go back home until another visiting time slot was opened. He held on for a few days. When we were alone, we'd spoken during moments of his lucidity. He had expressed his guilt over the pain his dying was causing to his loved ones. He looked at me with a weak but genuine smile every time I asked if he was okay. He never once complained of pain. He even outright denied pain medication when offered. His reasoning was that someone else would need it and not him. We all knew he was hurting. But on that last night, he said to me, I want this to be my final lesson to my family. I want to show them how to die with dignity. A few moments later, he asked me if I could say to him it was okay to die, to find peace and rest. He said he couldn't bear the thought of his family seeing him die. He wanted to hold on because he was his family's whole support system. But he finally said his pain was too much. He was ready to pass. I told him that he didn't need to keep fighting for his family's comfort. If he was truly in pain and ready to go, it would be okay to die. His family would understand. Once I gave him the okay, he started the process. Delirium, heavy breathing, and fidgeting, and the death rattle. And then he was gone. He was much a great man, a kind and gentle soul. I never knew for long, but I genuinely miss the man. Rest in peace, sir. Story 18. Not a nurse, but I was with two family members when they passed. They had sudden moments of clarity that only lasted a few seconds, but was the strangest, most religious, spiritual moments in my life. When my grandpa was dying, he was in full-blown sundowners. He wasn't coherent, couldn't really speak except in the early mornings, and was hallucinating all sorts of things like dead family members and stuff. Most of his communication was just paranoia about the nurses trying to kill him and awful stuff. I was a young teen, so my mom didn't really want me to be around him when he was like this. The last time I saw him, something clicked on in his head. It's like he fought through the cloud of unreality in his head and made direct eye contact with me and grabbed my hand. Determination, that's what's important, is all he said, but it was like he knew it was the last time he would see me. It was like someone said, all right, you've got four words, 
make them count. Immediately after that, he went back to a semi-vegetative state and mumbling. He died not long after that, and those words have pulled me through some of my toughest days. It was like the last lesson he had for me, and he had to tell me this. It took me a long time to really understand those words, but I faked it until I made it. Thanks, Grandpa. You were the best. Edit. Hey, guys. Please stop giving rewards. I appreciate the intent behind it, but use that money for something good. Story 19. I'm not a nurse, but I do know my father's, possibly, last words. I wasn't there, but he called me and left me a long voicemail. It was the middle of the night, so I was passed out. It all boiled down to him apologizing for a fight we had months before, after which we didn't talk for a while. The final words I have recorded before he hung up were, and I quote, I hope you don't blame yourself for what is going to happen, but I think this is the end for me. I'm sorry I couldn't talk to you one last time. He committed suicide within an hour of that voicemail, according to the coroner's report. I was only 17 at the time. When I woke up the next morning, it was too late to call him back. It may not be haunting to most, but it does haunt me to this day. And I still blame myself, because I could tell from his voice that that fight was still weighing on him. Edit. Thank you, everyone, for the kind words. It has taken a lot of time to pull myself back up from that dark place. Are there still some days where I want to off myself? Absolutely. But I try and hope for the better days to keep me here on this rock. I'm somewhat better after years of therapy and medications to help with my own mental illness. But I do feel this will probably be something that sticks with me until I'm put into my own grave. Story 20. This isn't something my grandma said to me, but something I said to her while she was in hospice, just a few hours before she passed. She had reached a point where she couldn't speak anymore, but she could gesture a little bit. I was alone with her in her room, and my aunt and uncles, all of her kids except my dad, were chatting in the hall. I could tell she wanted something, that it was important. I just had a feeling she wanted her kids, that this was a last chance kind of thing. I poked my head into the hall and told them, Grandma wanted them and they should all come. I got brushed off, and they wouldn't come the few feet into her room or stop chatting for a few minutes. I went back in and told her that everything was okay and that all of her kids were just in the next room and that everyone was here, and we loved her. She seemed panicked for a moment, but them calmed down. I think she knew I was telling her it was okay to go and was accepting it. I lied to her. My dad wasn't there. He had been arrested earlier that day. We kept it from her, and I couldn't tell her that her kids couldn't be bothered to come to her. It haunts me that I had to lie to the grandmother that raised me on her deathbed. I don't think I'll ever fully forgive my aunt and uncles. She hadn't had more than two of her kids in the same room in 20 years, and they couldn't even let her see it happen. Story 21. My brother didn't, couldn't really talk while he was dying, but the look in his eyes before his death rattle will haunt me forever. Whatever he saw, it awed him like a kid seeing Disneyland for the first time. I've never seen a person's eyes go so wide. My guess is he saw the whole damn universe at once. Wouldn't that be cool? Edit I'm writing this through tears. But thank you all for what you've commented and the awards. I've really struggled to make sense of his death. He was 35, but this post has unlocked a lot of deeply buried feelings. Truly, thank you to all of you who took the time to read what I wrote and commented. Ever since I've posted it, I've been talking to my brother and it feels good to do again. I really hope all of us get to witness the beauty peacefully. Story 22 physical therapist here. I treated a man in his 90s who was a DNR DNI. At least once a week when I would go to his room to start our sessions, he would cry and say, I didn't want to kill the kids. After speaking to his nurse, it was revealed that he had killed children in W2. He collapsed during a session and said, the kids are here to get me. He died a few minutes later. Edit. He wasn't displaying fear when he verbalized this after he collapsed. He seemed at peace. Story 24. This isn't creepy, but sweet. I used to plan fundraising events and held a candlelight memorial walk around our hospice house campus every year. One year, there was a hospice patient in the house in her final hours on morning of the event. She told all of her family, don't worry, I'm leading the parade today. As she passed later that day, her family saw us setting up. When we told them what we were doing, they all started to laugh and cry. They brought her photo out with them that night as they led the procession. Story 25. I've written about this before, but I'm a palliative nurse, and there is this trend I've noticed. Sometimes when people are in the process of dying, they can become delirious and hallucinate. I've heard from at least five people that they are scared of the dog in the room and they want me to remove it. Like legit different people in completely different rooms over the span of two years, telling me to take the dog out of the room because they don't like it staring at them. Share edit, I didn't realize our no sleep is supposed to be for fake stories. My bad, Oi. Story 26. When I was 16, I worked as a dietary aide in a pretty nice nursing home. There was this one older gentleman that I became pretty good friends with. He always talked about WW2 
and how he had lost so many guys in his company. Several days in a row, I had noticed that he wasn't coming down to the dining room for lunch or dinner. Went to his room to check on him, and he wasn't there. The nurse said he had a spell and fell out of his bed. His doctor wanted him to go to the hospital for observation. What had really happened is he had a stroke. He got back to the nursing home about a week later, and he really couldn't remember anyone except for me. We talked the day after he got back, and he told me he wasn't doing good. He knew his time was coming to a close. Said it was time for him to pay for all the horrible things he had done when he was over in Europe. He wasn't a religious man, but he asked me where I thought he was going. I said to bed because it's getting close to lights out. He said, no, Joe, BTW, my name is Mike. I mean, up or down. Now I'm not a deeply religious person either, but I said, Martin, that's not for me to say. He laughed and said, I know where I'm going. There's only one place for people who have done what I've done. I've killed so many people, Joe. Most of the time, it didn't matter who it was. We went into buildings just shooting. There's only one place for me. It's what I deserve. I had absolutely nothing to respond with. When I say that experience shook me to the core, I really mean it. That man's face is burned into memory because of that conversation. He passed away the next day. His son said he kept asking where Joe was at. I quit that day. Working in a nursing home is a haunting place. It takes a special type of person to be able to watch people just die around you. Story 27. AirDoc had a patient who had a heart attack at home while cooking dinner. Right before he had a full cardiac arrest in the ER while we were getting him hooked up to monitors and stuff, he goes, ah, shot, while, of course, panning for air and sweating like he was running a marathon. I asked what was wrong, and he goes, I forgot to turn off the oven before I kicked the bucket. He immediately tried to die. Story 28. Guy confessed to being a Nazi war criminal. Not dementia. He was with it. I don't think he'd ever told anyone. I'm nothing but a murderer. Died a day or so later. Okay, he was mid-90s. This was five years ago. I saw he was German, saw his age, and asked if he served in the war. He said yes. I said I was in the army myself when I was young. I asked some questions about what he did and such. And after a little while, he broke down and talked about his participation in killing Jews in Russia. He was a junior officer in a Wehrmacht unit. He knew he was dying. It all came out, and he cried for a long time. Sorry to disappoint the kids, but as a former combat armed soldier and a nurse, I simply cannot hate him, and I have sympathy for him. Story 29. Not a nurse was an EMTB on the 911 unit that got a call about a hit and run. Cops were on scene first. The area of the city I worked in was rough. Some guy in his GF had got into a fight in the parking lot. It ended with the guy running over his GF, then backing up over her. Needless to say, she wasn't doing well, and her vitals were tanking. We loaded her up with a fireman and police officer joined with us in the back of the rig. She kept mumbling, tell my mom, please tell my mom. And naturally, I figured it was her asking us to let her mom know she was hurt. The hospital takes care of that, and I put it out of my mind rather quick as we were working over her. She flatlined before we arrived. They did not get her back. My partner was finishing up her paperwork, and we turned to give her wallet back to the staff. The nurse on duty, who I knew pretty well, was reading a dirty piece of paper. She looked disgusted. When I asked what was up, she simply put the piece of paperwork down. It was a letter that was picked up near her purse on scene. She had gotten accepted into a college. I realized then that in the ambulance, she was asking us to tell her mom she got into college. That is a deep sadness I have never forgotten. Edit, fixed, an auto-corrected word. Story 30. Heard my patient talking to herself, so I go in and check on her. She said she was talking to her deceased husband and said, You don't see him? He's sitting in the chair. Sent a chill down my spine, and then she coded a few minutes later. Shit had me spooked as a new nurse at it. It didn't help that it was on night shift and I was standing near the chair when she said it. Had me so spooked, since I was only a nurse for a few months. Story 31. When my sister was on her deathbed, she would point and ask who the people were in her room when no one else was there. Then I'd see her having conversations with these invisible people. I finally asked her what she was talking about and with who. She said she was talking to our grandfather. He died 20 years prior. He told her he was there to help her cross over. She told him she wasn't ready to go. He said to her that it has to be her decision, and when she's ready to take his hand, he will guide her across. Story 32. So, this is a little different. I am a nurse, but this happened to my grandmother. I'm not sure where I stand in terms of religion, but my grandmother was deeply religious. She had been deaf for over 70 years. She talked like a deaf person, singed like a deaf person, etc. We had her at home and she died in her bed. But two to four minutes before she passed, she sat up in bed screaming, They're here! 
they're here with the clearest non-deaf voice. She, she started singing a gospel song with the clearest non-deaf voice. She passed about halfway through the song. I will never forget it. I have no earthly explanations for how she sang and talked so clear at the end. I have been with many patients that have died, and usually there isn't anything that happens. They stopped talking, responding long ago, and they just have the agonal breathing at the end. Nothing like when my GMA passed. Story 33. I'm not a nurse, but my grandparents passed three days apart from each other. My grandmother was diagnosed with lung cancer and began treatment. About halfway through, she sat everyone down and told us she felt her life was so fulfilled and would stop treatment, essentially choosing to pass peacefully. My grandfather was healthy, the type of man who went to the gym until he was 90. Just in impeccable shape and health, honestly. My grandmother was on her deathbed for a long while, in and out of consciousness, no longer communicating often, and only eating ice chips. It really tore my grandfather up. And one day he was at the grocery store and just had a heart attack and passed away within minutes. A few days later, my dad and I were sitting with my grandmother in her room. I was holding her hand and remember my dad telling her my grandfather's waiting for her whenever she's ready and she won't have to go alone. My grandmother spoke her first words in a week and said, he's right here with me, I see him. My dad said, what's he wearing? Which at the time, I thought it was an odd question. But she giggled and said, He's in my favorite gray suit. I think we're going out. She was such a fashionable woman, so they always were so well-dressed. She passed that evening. We had their funeral together, and my dad dressed him in the suit. She told him my grandfather was wearing. They were so in love. Still to this day, I've never seen anyone compare to what they had. A part of me feels my grandfather died of a broken heart, but also knew she needed him onto their next journey. It tears me to pieces every time I think of her last words. I know they're happy and together. I miss them both so much, the world is a little dimmer without them. Story 34. My dad was in the hospital and found out he had lung cancer. It was him, my stepmom, and a nurse in the room. He told my stepmom to get him something just to get her to leave the room. The nurse said that before she could stop him, he took off his oxygen mask, said, I'm done, and he lost consciousness immediately. He was on life support for a day or so, but he was already gone. When we pulled the plug, his body died in less than five minutes. I guess he really was done. Story 35, not my deathbed because I'm still here, but I had a cardiac arrest while in hospital. Before it happened, my mom was visiting, and I remembering being terrified of going to sleep and begging her not to leave. I could just feel a presence in the room, and my mom says I kept looking over to the corner of the hospital room I was in. Eventually, I fell asleep, and she went home. As she arrived home after the hour drive, she got the call to say I'd had a cardiac arrest. Story 36. So this happened a couple of years ago. We had an ex-gang guy who was dying of cancer, and he confessed that he was the gang hitman for many years. He wanted to confess to all the killings and show the police where the bodies are buried. He would get closure knowing that the surviving families of his victims find out where they are buried. We had to get the hospital legal team involved because we had no policies to deal with that. Cops got involved and the dude confessed to gang murders from decades ago. Story 37. Years ago, I drove a taxi in Boston. One night, after I dropped a fare off at Children's Hospital, a man jumped in and asked to be taken to the airport. As we drove along, I could hear him sobbing in the rear seat. I didn't want to intrude uninvited, so I just drove silently. When we got to the airport, he asked if I could just pull over somewhere. He wanted to try to compose himself before entering the terminal. He said to me, I'm a doctor and an oncologist. I help save people all the time, but I can't do anything for my own daughter. She's dying of lymphoma. My wife can't understand why I can't save her. I've never felt so helpless in my life. It's tearing me apart. We talked for a long time. I stayed with him until he went into departures. This was more than 40 years ago, yet it still stays with me. The sadness some must endure. Story 38. I'm going home. I worked as a nurse's aide in a nursing home for just two months. Brand new. This gentleman was assigned to my caseload the entire time I'd worked there and was on hospice the whole time, but had seemed to be doing well. This night, I was working with him, and he seemed off. I talked to him and explained what I was doing to care for him, but he just sounded so angry and confused. I was new to this, so I didn't know quite what to do, so I pressed on. He got so freaked out. He took his oxygen tubing and tried to wrap it around my throat to strangle me. I got away, told the nurse, and was told that confusion and aggression were common when people were dying. He needed his care regardless. I went to care for him again a few hours later, and he looked so docile, so defeated. His eyes filled with tears as he looked at me and told me, I'm real sorry for what I did earlier, ma'am. That's not who I am. I'm so sorry. I told him it was okay and that I just wanted to make him comfortable. He thanked me and said the line, I'm going home. He just kept repeating it and sounded so urgent. 
I'm going home, I'm going home, I'm going home. I thought he was still confused. He passed away one one to two hours later, right after my shift was over. I was the one to hear his last words. Upon learning that he passed away, I immediately thought of those last words. Sticks with me to this day. This was almost 12 years ago, and I don't think I'll ever forget. Story 39. I had a patient whose memory had been fading for years. It's weird, right before a patient dies, sometimes they'll suddenly be doing a lot better. Anyway, he thought I was his late wife. I played along and just listened to him while he recalled his engagement, his wedding, his first childbirth, and a few other memories for me. At one point, he says, Oh, Irene, there you are. Sorry, you know my eyes aren't as good as they used to be. Well, thank you for listening to an old man tell his stories. I hope you have great stories to tell one day, too. I'm coming, Irene. And then he passed. He was my first longtime patient. Story 40. A couple odd and sad ones for me, but one of mine is an elderly lady who was pleasantly confused and a comforty care PT who was on the way and I was giving her a bath one night. And I asked how she was doing and she goes, I'm a DNR baby, I'm doing just fine. She passed 30 minutes later, edit. And I was teaching a new grad who this was her first PT like this. So it made it a little more meaningful for us. Story 41. I'm not a nurse, but I provided hospice care for a loved one so she could die in her own home rather than a hospital. At the end, she became convinced that taking morphine for the pain was killing her. She would lay in agony asking me for help, but refused the pain meds. I resorted to just raising and lowering her bed to help her get comfortable. The day she died, her cat went from being aloof to sleeping on the bed with her. Cats know things. Story 42. Not a nurse, but I'm a surgeon who does critical care, ICU, by training. Most recent haunting holy shit thing that was said was an 87 y very, very, very German guy with acute mesenteric ischemia, essentially a heart attack, but in the gut. His bowels were dead and he was basically dead man walking for the next four hours. When I told him that I asked if he wanted me to call his wife, COVID restrictions prevented her from being there in person. He just sighed and said, 65 years, wasted. I hate that. Don't call her. Get me a beer, a German one. It's almost too dramatic to be real. But I swear to you, those were his words. I honestly tried to get the man a beer, but I figured die lauded would suffice to ease his transition. Story 43. I was caring for an elderly neighbor, grocery shopping, driving him to doctor appointments, and checking in on him. One day I went to check on him and he didn't answer after several knocks. I called the police for a well check and they found him on the floor, alive. When I went to visit him at the hospital after he'd been treated for congestive heart failure, he told me there were little men in the corner of his room. They were coming for him, so he tried to get away. Even long after he was placed in a nursing home, he insisted the little men had been there for him. Story 44. I had a 90-plus-year-old patient come in after he fell at home and suffered rib fractures. He was bleeding internally, but was a DNR, DNI, and insisted that he did not want extreme measures to be kept alive if they were needed. He was completely appropriate and coherent. I got him settled and tucked him into bed and told him to get some sleep. A little while later, he pushed his call light for me to come in. I went in the room and he said, I'm embarrassed to say this because you will think I'm crazy. There's a man in a suit sitting in that chair. And of course, points to an empty chair in the room. He goes, he is asking me to go with him. He told me that if I go with him right now, I get to start all over. He was scared, and I told him that while I believed he could see the man, I could not see him. He asked me what he should do, and I told him that if he did not want to go, he should tell the man that he has decided he doesn't want to go with him and that he should leave him alone. He said he would do that, and I told him to call me if he needed me. The next morning, he told me he asked the man to leave, and he got up and walked out and didn't come back. I left in the morning and was off for a while and never found out what eventually happened. Story 45. Not a nurse, but was a cop. And I was with a 20-year-old who took his own life. He checked into a nice hotel and his parents reported him missing. Anyways, they found out he was in a hotel by a credit card charge. I was the responding officer and when I arrived, I knocked on the door he answered and was really cool. We chatted for a few minutes and I asked him if he was willing to come downstairs to meet with his parents. He went back into his room and I held the door open. It appeared he was putting on a jacket, but he pulled out a gun, placed it on his temple and said, damn my family, this is on them, and pulled the trigger. First time, someone mulled themselves in front of me and wasn't the last. That shit haunts you years later. Story 46. My mom has been a nurse for 30 plus years and she says the amount of patients tell their nurses, I'm going to die today, or I'm about to die, or some version of it is staggering. She said they often seem to know, and you learn to believe them. Once when I was 16, I passed out. And while my brother calls 911, she tried to get me upright to ask some questions for info for the paramedics. At one point, I said, I don't want to die. And she said nothing. In all her decades of hearing patients say things like that and worse, has ever scared her more. Thankfully, obviously, I am alive and well. But yeah. Story 47. 
pulmonary doc here. Had a longtime patient of mine with bad asthma. She was one of the hospital nurses and a friend in the hospital for a bad exacerbation. She had the nurse taking care of her call me at home. On a rare Saturday, I was off begging me to come in. So I do, of course. All she said with tears going down her face is, is it okay if I change to hospice? Please tell me it's okay. That messed me up for quite a while. Story 48, I used to work building maintenance in a large nursing home that had four levels of care. There was complete independent living in fancy duplexes on the large property, then semi-independent living in the apartment building, private full care in the apartments, and the end-of-life care in a separate wing. Anyway, there was one resident in the independent apartments who was just the sweetest old man you could ever hope to meet, but there was something off about the way he looked at some people, and I just couldn't figure it out. His family also never came to see him in the 20 years he lived there, so obviously, something was off. One day he came stumbling into the maintenance corridor and moving like he was being chased, then fell down gasping for breath right in front of the entire maintenance crew. He looked up at us and his face changed from sweet old man to a scary dangerous and he hissed at us. I only regret we didn't finish. He took a few more gasping breaths and just died. A month later, I get a work order to bag up his apartment and throw everything in the dumpster. His family refused to come remove his belongings and demanded nothing be donated. Everything goes in the trash. So, two of us on the maintenance crew started working on bagging everything up, and about 20 minutes into it, my coworker whispered at me, Get over here. I walked into the kitchen, and on the counter was a beautiful large oak box with the lid open. I think we both just stood there, staring for a good five minutes. Inside was a knife, a pistol, extra pistol magazines and ammo, my tree medals, and a large velvet bag sitting on top of two bars of gold. Everything had swastikas stamped on it. I hesitantly opened the velvet bag, and what I saw still haunts me. 25 years later, gold teeth. Once we got the facility's administrator up there to look at the contents, she said, great, another one. Stay here and don't let anyone in and don't touch anything else until I tell you different. We stayed in that room for two more hours, twiddling our thumbs until a couple FBI agents showed up, asked for our accounts of how we found it, asked if we took anything, then told us to go. By the end of the day, there was a team of people there, packing everything up and loading it all into an unmarked moving van. Story 49. The very first patient I cared for during school was palliative. I had him for a week and my job was very minimal. Keep him company and help him drink when he wanted it. I was in his room and he started saying, there is a girl on my bed. I asked him who is the girl and he just said, the girl sitting on the end of my bed. I didn't think much of it, just thought he was a bit confused. Went home and the next morning I happened to come in early. And the nurse on said to me, oh, you came early. Sorry to tell you your client died yesterday after you left. It sent shivers down my body. It was like he saw a presence in his room right before he died. My teachers had told us sometimes patients would see spirits right before they died, but I didn't believe it. Story 50. My mom had a lot of strokes. The last one permanently took her ability to speak. I remember getting then called that she was in the hospital again. I went to the ER and the doctors told me she was septic and had a heart attack. Her chances were low for survival. And if she did make it, she wouldn't be the same. I had to choose to make her comfortable and die, or for the doctors to try to save her life and have her just existing, which is what she did at the hospice. I loved her and wanted her comfortable. I stayed with her till she died. She couldn't talk, so she held my hand. I put my forehead to hers and told her that I loved her. I also played the Bee Gees music on the phone, one of her favorites. To answer the question, nothing. I didn't hear her say anything, and I wished it could have been anything that she could have said. It's been seven years ago, and I still wish for that. Sorry, this sort of doesn't answer the question, but I wanted to tell someone. Story 51. Made a trip to see my dad's mom. She knew she was on the way out. She was on comfort care. We were there to say our goodbyes. I had a few moments with her before we left. Her kids stayed with her to the end. She was in her mid-80s, and her mind was still sharp as a tack. It was just her and I in the room, and I told her I loved her. She looked me right in the eyes and said, I'm sorry this is taking so long. I think I fumbled something out about how it was okay, and we just wanted her to be comfortable. She ended passing sometime after 2 a.m. that night. Two of her daughters were in the room asleep. The story I was told was that the phone in the room rang a single time, waking both daughters, and they checked on her, and she was gone. The belief is that she rang that phone to let them know their watch was over. Story 52. My mom was with my grandfather when he died from cancer at home. She said he was talking to his mom, my great-grandmother, and then started kissing the air and trying to sit up, giving air hugs. I know he is with his parents and his elder brother now. I'm so grateful they were there to welcome him. I hope his childhood dog who was poisoned by his neighbors was there too. He loved that dog. One day, I hope he and my grandmother are there for me when my time comes. Story 53. 
My aunt, who was like a mother to me, was dying from cancer. We were housemates for a few years before she was diagnosed, and they were some of the best years of my life. We used to sit out on the back veranda in the evenings with a glass of red and talk about our days, life, and all kinds of other random funny shit. I don't think I've ever laughed with anyone like I laughed with her. I'm so glad I got to have that time with her. She was an amazing woman. She wanted to pass at home amongst her family. So when we knew it was close, we all hung out at her place with her. The last time she was up and about with all of us, she got up from her chair and headed off to bed for the last time. Then she turned and looked at me and said, Good night, love, just like she did every night when we lived together. They were her last words, and four days later, she passed away with all of us there in the room with her. As horrible as it all was, I felt honored to be there for her last moments. She was one hell of a human being. Story 54. I'm not a nurse, but I work in healthcare. Sometimes it's not the words, but the lack of words that haunts me and saddens me most. There was once an old man who was really bad off. There was not family around at the time, and he was unresponsive, but had his eyes and mouth gaped open. I watched as his breathing slowed and eventually stopped, and the monitor stopped getting vitals. I watched his eyes glaze over while his dry, bloody mouth gaped open. It reminded my grandparents and how life is too short-lived. The worst part? was seeing his family react to him. He should have died around them, not me. Story 55. Not a nurse, but right before my dad passed away in 2014, he told my brother and I, 26 and 25 at the time, he felt as if his time was now. He had stage four esophageal cancer. Anyways, he said one. I love you, proud of you, sorry for his wrongdoings. Was an addict, made some poor choices, but he was a good guy. Two, he said some dude owed him $750. My dad had no savings, so it was a big deal to him. We got it back. Three, to smoke all his weed and good night. His last words to us, I'll forever miss that crazy dude. Story 56. During compression, a kid sat straight up and yelled for his mommy. We never got a pulse back after that. The child was carried up seven flights of stairs by the cardiologist who sent the child in from the op office. The cardiologist found the mother talking to registration on the ground floor, took one look at the pale child, checked a pulse only to find it weak and thready. He thought running up the stairs to the peak he was fasted, then traversing the hospital to the ER. Mother never made it to the room. I later heard she broke down in the waiting room and couldn't make herself go to the code. Edit one, the story is out of order to address the original question. The background information is to address that the child's mother wasn't there and honor the heroic effort of the cardiologist. P.S. I'm not a writer. I give excellent compressions. Story 57. Not a nurse, but it seems that most people here are recounting last things people said prior to dying. So here's mine. My grandmother, who raised me, had pulmonary fibrosis and was in and out of the hospital multiple times leading up to her passing. My mother-in-law worked as a nurse at the hospital. My grandmother had been admitted to and called me, letting me know that her vitals were bad and I should rush to there ASAP. I made it and sat at her bedside while she had her keypad mask on. I knew but didn't know at the same time that this was the last time I was going to see her alive when I first arrived. I held her hand and cried while begging inside to let me feel her pain so she wouldn't suffer. I told her I loved her and everything was going to be okay while I tried to hide my tears. She looked at me very deeply with love in her eyes and said, It's okay, mijo. I love you, but I need to prepare myself and I need you to go. That's when I felt the room change. It felt heavy and I knew this would be the last time we'd exchange words. I walked out of her room and turned around and said, I love you. To which she replied, no matter what happens, mijo, I'll always love you, but go. Leaving that room was the hardest thing to do, but I respected her wishes. By the time my wife and I made the 20 mile drive home, I received the call the she passed. My meals nurse co-workers on that floor mentioned that my grandmother had really stuck it out until I showed up to say our goodbyes. Story 58. I'm not a nurse, but the day my dad died from a brain tumor, he finally was able to remember who my mom was after four months of forgetting. I was two at the time and not remember him at all. My mom said on the day he died, he seemed just like him and called her by the nickname he gave her. Later that day, he died. My family's religious and my mom believes God gave him my mom one last time together before he died. Makes me teary-eyed every time I think about it. Story 59. I've had multiple patients ask me how the process of dying happens what they should expect in those last few hours days. This is usual with terminal patients where you can clearly see the beginning of the process. Well, I'll not forget the one patient, 97 years old, congestive heart failure, very intelligent man, no cognitive deficits, who said to my colleague, is Mrs. Derham here yet? If she arrives, please let her report to me immediately. I'm dying and she has to tell me how that works. Exactly. I want to know. I went in, answered his questions as well as I could. And a few hours later, he died. Another one was a 93-year-old woman 
who was so ready to die. She really wished for it. Well, her breathing stopped and she had no peripheral pulse. I did not resuscitate as wished, but I did change her position a bit to make it easier on the heart. I had to, like legally had to. She gasped for air, looked at me and angrily said, Really? I'm still here? I thought I finally had it. I've never felt so guilty for just doing my job. She did the almost die some more times. Then, one time, she really finally got it and died for real. One patient I, which I had to resuscitate as by family wish, also it was thought to be his wish, living will, and also doctor's orders, died before me like I was in the room and could start instantly. We got him back after 1.5 meon of downtime. He looked at me, pressed my hand, and said, Next time... Please just walk out and don't return for an hour or so. He died a month later. Another one I'll never forget is from my time as a student. I was working night shifts to earn money. She was terminally ill with lung cancer. She was not afraid of dying, but she was afraid of the feeling of gasping for air. The bun promised her enough morphine and benzos so she wouldn't feel a thing, as was the family's wishes, and her wish, since she was dying, like in her last days. Damn ass, a doctor wouldn't allow us to give her the medication she needed. Because, I don't know, I'm an expert in sports medicine, but to me that sounds like too much. No, I can't let you telephone with another doctor who actually knows about palliation or oncology. It's just me. No, I won't come and look at the patient. I've never before or since seen someone die so cruelly. She was drowning in her own fluids. She was clear-headed and her poor body fought for every breath. She was so afraid, not of dying, but of the pain of the next breath. Now, as an RN, I would insist on another doctor, and even then I thought my friend should have telephoned some more. But then, as a student, new to everything... I didn't dare to touch that phone myself. I just sat there with her, made her as comfortable as possible. She grabbed my hand and pressed it long and hard enough that I got hematoma after. I stayed with her even after my shift, until the day nurse got another doctor on the line, and we could finally give her what she needed. I'll never forget her. Story 60. Male nurse here. I was taking care of a patient who was expected to discharge that day. They suffered an unexpected massive stroke and passed away despite everything we did to save him. I still have lower back issues from the rounds of CPR I did that day. Anyways, I digress. Once things settled down, we attempted to locate family members or friends to contact. This patient was between homes, very clean, nice man who was a recent immigrant from Asia. We couldn't find any contacts for anyone to notify of his passing. As we went through his wallet, we found handwritten cards he had made to hand out to others, with his email address, and a message saying, can we make friends? I walked straight to the bathroom and started crying. This happened just a couple of weeks after I had tried to save the life of a neighbor who had been shot, who also passed, and it was all just too much for me. It was already sad that this nice man had no one for us to call. When I read those cards, it absolutely broke my heart. It took me a few months to get over those two weeks. Edit. Wow. I'm absolutely humbled by the upvotes and awards. Thank you, kind Redditors. Story 61. Not a nurse, but my mom once told me that in her dad's final days, when he was over at her parents' house taking care of him, she was sitting in his room waiting for him to come out of the bathroom and overheard him say out loud to himself, and I suppose, his God, God, I hope you can accept a sorry son like me. She suspected that he may have had a child he didn't own up to sometime in the 1940s before he met my grandmother, but never had any confirmation of that. Story 62, ICU nurse here, had a completely oriented, but in a lot of pain, cancer patient asked me, who is that man standing over there? And pointed to the doorway. I responded that I didn't see anyone there, but maybe it was another nurse walking by in the hall. She then weakly clapped her hands together and said, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Thank you. As if she was speaking to the man in the doorway. And then she passed away moments later. Story 63. I'm a keen ain't going to school to be a nurse, and I work in a nursing home. The most haunting thing I ever heard was from a resident we had, who was the strong and silent type. We always had to basically pry answers out of him because he grew up in a time where men just shrugged things off. Expressing issues was just complaining in their eyes. When he was nearing his death, he had pancreatic cancer. I worked an overnight where he was awake, which was not normal for this guy. He slept through the night every other time I'd worked with him. Towards the end of the night, around 4 a.m., he starts hollering out for us to come help. Working in a nursing home, you usually think, fall. So we grabbed our vitals cart and a mechanical lift, and when we opened the door, he was just laying in bed. I flipped on the light to see if maybe he injured himself, and I can remember clear as day the expression on his face. His eyes were wide with tears streaming down each side of his face, as he stared mouth wide open towards the ceiling. A man I always equated to kind of an old school dad, was laying there, trembling with his hands clenched deeply into the comforter. I walked up to him and asked what was wrong, kind of hoping maybe it was a night terror, but when I got close, he grabbed my scrub pocket and pulled me as close as possible and wrapped his arms around me. He sobbed into my should for what seemed like forever, just repeating, I don't want to die. We gave him Ativan and morphine not too long after, 
and he was gone before my shift was done. I work in a field that has death as a common factor to our jobs. We joke about it and treat it as no more solemn than changing a brief or taking vitals. But that night, I was rocked to my core, and I think that was the one and only time I had to cry when I got home. Story 64. Not a nurse, but I cared for my mom until the moment she died. At 4 a.m., we were talking, and she thought my dad was in the next room. He had passed 12 years previously. I assured her we were all fine and gave her permission to go and see dad. She fell asleep, never regained consciousness, and died that day. Her last words, I love you. The previous day, she said, I won't go in the morning, I won't go overnight. Sure enough, it was 2 p.m. Edit, I was stuck for seven hours with my mom's body. I did what I could put her favorite body lotion on, and zizzed her upper lip hair and chin hair, wanted her to look her best. I gave up after five hours. She was too cold. Edit two. It is truly awful to, to have your mother's dead body in the bed for that length of time before a doctor can come and issue a death certificate. Edit three. After the undertaker was permitted, once the death certificate was issued, me and my brother went out and celebrated a job well done. He was a medic. I was the care. Mum died where she wanted, in her own bed at home. Edit 4. People who didn't understand were asking, Why are you not at home grieving? We were celebrating giving her what she wanted. You only get one chance to help a parent die. Can't go back and do it again. Story 65. When my grandma was dying, we had her at home. I stayed up with her at night to check on her and keep her comfortable. A couple days before she died, she sat bolt upright, in bed, stretched out her arms and screamed, Daddy! In the most excited, childish voice, her father had died in an accident when she was, I think, five. She then laid back down and never opened her eyes or spoke again. She was gone a couple days later. I am convinced when she called out, it was because her dad came to get her, and after that, it was just a body taking time to shut off. Speaking of her dad, his last words were haunting. Back in the day, mid-30s, you could buy cans of kerosene to toss in your stove to light it. Someone had filled one with gas by mistake, and when he tossed it in the stove, the whole thing exploded. When he pushed on the screen door to get out all of the skin on his hands, stuck to the door. His last words were to the ambulance crew. Be easy with me, boys. This is my last ride. 